I think number nine was an issue for a few people. You guys need number nine? Okay, one, three. <coughs> one, thing, one thing to think about with number nine is they say that there's, uh, they give you an initial condition, which is just your initial condition. That's a separate thing to think about. What's the amount of water in the tank at any given time? Or the amount of salt, sorry. At any given time. No, at any given time. That's only at time zero. The minute they turn this thing on, and you're like, who's doing this weird shit? Better ways to dilute solution. No, 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 no. At any given time, how much is in there? You can't tell me a number because it's constantly changing. So the amount of salt at a time is A of T. I like it. And uh, what was it? Here it is. Okay. So it says pure water is pumped in at a rate of three gallons per minute, and then you're losing, it's stirred, and then you're losing that. So, so uh, how much, let me see, how much is it? So there's uh, 300 gallons total, right, of, uh, of water? Yes. So at any given time, how much salt is there? Uh, what's the um, percentage of salt? What's the, the um, salt solution? It's going to be this out of 300, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so they pump some in, they mix it, and they pump it out at the same rate. So at how quickly or how much salt am I losing per minute? So they pump in three gallons per minute, right? Three gallons of water per minute. This is, uh, A is in pounds, is that right? Yes. Yes. This is pounds per gallon. So look at this way. Uh, three gallons per minute. Can you convert? Three gallons. How do I convert that to salt? Well, I know this is true. Now, A is changing constantly, right? But whatever it is, this is the conversion at that instant. So a, a nice way to think about this problem is you're really just converting three gallons that I'm losing to pounds of salt. How many pounds of salt am I losing? Well, how do I convert gallons to pounds of salt? Here. <coughs> right when you just multiply three gallons by what? By... A pounds per 300 gallons. You guys get that? Uh, and, and then you can bring them per minute in. That doesn't even have to be a part of it to begin with. I'm just converting. Every minute I'm losing three gallons. All right, how much salt am I losing then? Well, I use this conversion. This is my uh, gallons of water to salt pounds conversion. That's, that's period. Now, there are other ways to look at this, but me, when I read this problem for the first time, that's kind of the way I broke it down. You can use the book's example and just plug shit in and go to town, but I like to really be able to analyze the parts of it and see why it makes sense. It's just a conversion problem, and this will be per minute. So then you can stick that in there, and, and uh, how much salt are you having come in? Well, it's pure water. So zero. And you're losing this. So zero minus this equals D, A, D, T, blah, blah, blah. All right, that's enough of that. The stairs I'm getting tell me that maybe some of you guys haven't tried this yet. So if you took a little bit of notes, that'll help you in number nine. Um, what was the other one? 21. Oh, yeah. I like this one. So blah, blah, blah. Oh, they tell you up here at the beginning, Newton's second law of motion becomes this. And so they give you, right before number 21, they give you for this section a little hint that get this, this is the general, the thing we normally see the MA is actually assuming that M is constant, which is not true for situations like this, where the mass is dependent on something that's being lost over time. Uh, or even gained, rolling stone. Let's see. Um, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Air resistance. Oh, beautiful. I love it. And they give you an example with air resistance, right? Yeah, right there. I love it. So instead of using MDVDT in that air resistance problem, 
you use d by dt mv, and then how do you attack this? You can just use uh, product rule. They're both functions of time now. Okay. Try that one out. It looks like a lot of you guys haven't tried that one out yet. Okay. I'm not going to give too much away until I get some, some people going, will I try this? Will I try this? And if you haven't tried anything yet, I'm not going to say any more. Uh, I think number, wasn't it number 18 also? So you have this combined with the example. That's a good place to start. Look at the resistance example combined with this, this generalization of that one piece of it. 18 is one of my favorites. The whole idea of uh, Archimedes' principle is, is really kind of neat. Um, if you watch Mythbusters, they had a few things that were related to that. Um, so what do you have to find? The, the force that's being provided in the equation, uh, so you have <coughs> MA equals F. So what's the force that's being provided to, to create this this motion buoyancy. is going to be buoyancy. It's going to be, that's what they tell you in the write-up. And the buoyancy is going to be equal to the weight of the displaced water. water. So if you look at the picture they give you, how here's the equilibrium position. And they give you the radius. Uh, what was it? Y of T, right? That's how much has been pushed down below its equilibrium position. So if you ever played with Something in the tub when you're a little kid, and you pushed on it, went, ah, and you push on it really hard, and it goes, yeah. because you gave it a lot of buoyant force, right? Um, so they pushed it a little bit below it, so the equilibrium position is that far below. So how much of the, the mass of this thing is considered then? Well, this much. So let's look at that from over, it's from like, let's kind of break that out and make it into more of a 3D thing going on. So that's this little chunk broken out. There's the radius of it. There's the height of it. Can you figure out the volume of it? And they give you the density of water. How's density, volume, and mass relate? This is the symbol I use for density. There's another one. There's another problem later that uses this for density. It don't matter. This is the one I always use for density. Yeah, mass per volume. So mass is density times volume. So if you can figure out the volume of this, multiplied by the density of water, you get the mass of the water that's displaced. Okay, and then you can throw that into this equation. You can replace this with the d squared piece, because I think they want an equation of motion. What's this going to become, considering what they define here? Yeah, d squared... Y is my motion. I'm going to be bobbing up and down. Y of T is my motion function. My position function, I right? so. So really, it's starting off with this and saying, what force is providing this? Well, in this case, it's the buoyant force. So I've got to write an expression for the buoyant force, which is the, mat, the weight of the water displaced, and then equal it to this. Solve for that, and that, there's my... DE that tells me the equation of motion, right? If you've ever taken any physics at all, you, this should be very... If you never have, you don't have to have. But normally at this level, several of you have done that. Kinematics is exactly this, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, and then I think somebody was asking about the dropping the bowling ball through the earth, which is always an interesting proposition. I love when the first sentence is an impossible thing. <laughs> so once you've done this impossible thing, then we do this other thing. You're like, all right, it's just a problem in a book, so let's assume that's doable. Uh, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this one. Uh, so 24, just to give you a couple of hints. Um, what's the force... The force for gravity, uh, gravitational pull, they give it to you. I think they use a different thing than I'm used to. I think they use K instead of G. Uh, 
I always use a G here for the gravitational constant, but all. So the force at any point when the bowling ball is moving, what's the force the bowling ball experiences? It's if it moves into the earth, the outer rim has nothing to do with it. It's all that inner. So what's the so the picture they tell you the big R is the whole thing, the little R is gonna be that uh, the radius of that chunked out portion in the middle. So this this is gonna be the force at any moment in its dropping is going to be negative kmr, m over r squared. Where mr is what they tell you is the mass of the region that it's, I think that what is good, the mass of that portion of the Earth within a sphere, blah, blah, blah. Yes, sir. Isn't it acceleration instead of force? The acceleration between the two objects is that? No. Force this is the gravitational force. Uh, yeah, this is this is the force that provides the acceleration, and it, it, and the k that term has all of the necessary units to make it come out right. That's the fudge factor for the way our universe is set up. It would be different if our universe had been set up a little differently. Uh, God, I don't want to spend too much more time on that. What else can I tell you? If if you nah, can you relate this to m? Well, what what's the what is MR going to be? Remember that mass is density times volume. What's the volume of a sphere of radius little r? Three fourths. No. Four thirds pi. Four thirds, four -thirds pi r cubed, r cubed times the density. And what's the mass of the Earth? Four thirds pi big ass r cubed times its density. So isn't there a relationship between these two things? Yes, there is. Uh, what else can I tell you without giving too much away? I mean, this is basically... These are kinematics again. There. We got our F equals MA, which you can write as M D squared Y. What are they? Do they give us any letters to use? It's small. Oh, R. So this is going to be this after I figure out the relationship between these two things. I can plug that in here. The little m is going to cancel. That always happens. Almost always. All right, it's enough of that. That's enough. That's enough. Uh, i got to do a little bit of new stuff before I go crazy. We'll do one problem from that section 2-3 that we did last time. <laughs> then I'll do a little bit from the next section. What did I say? Two one two two. <coughs> two one two two. Yeah, because we just did two three last time. I would never. Well, we could have done. Well, no, we're finishing two three right now, so I would never give you a quiz on that since we're just finishing it now. All right, here we go. So remember two three, and I'll tell you this right now. When we're done talking about all the methods in chapter two, I have this handout that kind of summarizes all the methods uh, and a big deal and on the other side is going to be this problem where the very first thing you do is you have to identify what methods work for these given DEs because when you're going to solve a problem your first step is what am I what can I use in this situation what can I use in this situation I mean that's if you don't take that step you're going to try the wrong thing at the wrong time and you're going to get all kinds of weird shit happening so chapter two is chock a block full of methods to use if they are in certain forms. So obviously the one we're going to talk about right now, the one we're going to review is what to do if it's linear and not separable, because if it's separable, I'm going to try that first. So that would be, uh, I'm going to write this, let's do Was I using a Q here yet? No. I think they were using a G. Yeah. Who remembers what the, if this is not separable, what is, and we worked out this integrating factor. I try to kind of show you a little bit of why it makes sense that there what, it might be one that exists. The integrating factor would be. Yeah, so that guy. So let's try an example. So what this means is if I multiply both sides by this, one side becomes D. Well, let's figure it out. 
This is what we. Uh, this is what I showed you last time. The shortcut, but you can always kind of figure it out as you do it. You don't have to memorize shit. Um, a little bit. So let's see. Where's an example? Let's do. Doesn't matter. Does that one look interesting? Yeah, it sort of looks interesting. Ooh. Ooh, I like that one a lot. Okay. Let's see. Let's just start in this form here. dy dx plus x over x squared minus 9y equals 0. So let's say I have my instruction said use the linear writing factor to do this. Is, is this separable? Can't you subtract that, divide by y, multiply by dx? Yeah. Are you guys doing all right? <laughs> so what's separable mean? That means I can get all my y shit on one side, all my x shit on the other side. That's separable. That makes sense. So could I separate things? Yeah, I could subtract this whole thing. Divide by y, multiply by dx, it's separable. Well, let's try this one with the integrating factor, just so we can get used to it. Separable is 180. The integrating factor is 285. Right. Um, I can make it not simple by putting some shit over there, right? So it's being nice. So what is p? What is p of x? Yes. So I have to figure out what this is. This is going to be my mu, my integrating factor. Do you see how, uh, let me, is this going to be a natural log of this, right? Because what's the derivative of this is, is, is a constant times x, and isn't that up there? And what do you need here to make it match with the derivative of this? You need what here? What? Oh, all right. Are you guys? Okay. You need a 2 up there. So you could do this. Right? And now it's exactly e to the 1 half times natural log of x squared minus 9. Right? Now, please, dear God. What's the integral of 1 over x cubed minus 7x? That is so freaking not the natural log of x cubed minus 7x. And not because I didn't put that there. No, no, no. Because is that guy's derivative in here? No, no so of course it's not going to be that. Because the derivative would never become 1 on the top. It's going to be 3x squared minus 7 on the top. And that ain't there, so too damn bad. Right? I'd have to use partial fractions on it. <laughs> Alright. Oh, that was a pro that was so creepy, it was awesome. <laughs> so so please dear God realize it's because this guy's derivative is up here, that's what makes it natural law. Not just because I'll, it's over that, so it must be natural. No, screw that. <laughs> Yeah, so that has to come up here, though, doesn't it? Yeah, okay. And these will cancel, so you get x squared minus 9 to the 1 half. Well, since it's being raised to 1 half power, to be honest, I have to, I have to assume that this is positive. Oh, oh, what's that? What did we just figure out? feels like we did a lot of work because I had to explain some stuff in the middle, but we haven't done much of shit. What do I do with that now? I multiply both sides by it. I don't plug it anywhere. I multiply everything by it. So let's see what this becomes if I do that. So using this, I multiply everything by this. So I get x squared minus 9 to the 1 half dy dx plus uh, x squared minus 9 to the 1 half times x over x squared minus 9, y equals 0. Just sucks it up a little bit, right? Notice here, sorry about the crappy pen. 
half of this goes away, so I'm left with a half of it on the bottom here. Now, if you remember this next thing I say, you don't have to even do that step. If I multiply this by mu everywhere, here, let's do it here. And this is a part of this condition, but look at this. Doesn't that look like a piece of mu times y? The beginning of a product rule if it was mu y? That's what it's always going to be. It's always going to be d mu y. That's the beauty of integrating factors. So what is this? It's actually d mu y equals zero. So derivative of y is there, leave that alone. Derivative of this is there, leave y alone. Then you integrate, what do you get? There's a dx I gotta throw over. What do you get when you integrate d this? You get that. That's the big thing to remember. Don't overdo this. That's the whole beauty of this. What do you get when you integrate it? Zero. Yes, derivative, well, it would be zero plus c, if you want to look at it that way. <coughs> derivative of what is zero? c. So the integral is zero, c. And then if you solve for y, you just divide by that shit. So integrating factors for linear, you got to get in there and try them out. It will always, this side, once you multiply by mu, now look at this ugly mess and look at this shit, ugly mess. I could have skipped all this shit and went straight to here because that's what integrating factor does. That's why I use it because it makes the one side become a product rule that's easy to integrate. I just got to recombine it so I can integrate. Maybe, maybe. Just got to get in and try it. I do want to do one new thing tonight. What time is it? Okay, good. So you y equals c over this. Okay. Right, solve for y. Um, blah, blah, blah. Let's see, how did I want to yeah, here we go. Oh, yeah, let's try this. Okay. So we got another one here? Wait. More than you want? Oh. So you just take it away? So mu always equals... Yes, this is the definition of the integrating factor. And it always equals after you've multiplied oh. everything through? Once you multiply both sides, then the one side becomes this, and the other side becomes mu times g of x, whatever the hell g of x was. This side's easy to integrate, and it'll be dx, of course, bring that dx up. Is that cool? Mm -hmm. This side's easy to integrate. This side, you hope to God, it's easy to integrate. If it isn't, then you go back and see if it was separable. Maybe that'll be easier to do, right? I would check if it's separable first. Or you, did, you, or you did your stuff right. Or you, yeah, you might have done something wrong. You integrated wrong the e. Okay. But yes, that's the point I'm trying to make, is all this work I did here, was really unnecessary. Now, on one level, I want you to be able to do that and see it, but on another level, that's part of this process, is you, you get here. That's where I started when I developed this process, was here. I love you guys. Okay. So, new thing for today, because that was old stuff. And I know you're going to get tired of me saying this, and I just don't really care. If you took, if you did take um, uh, 281, you, you saw this idea already, so you got a little bit of a head start on this. Um, so just to give a little motivation, this is not the DE yet, this is the motivation of where this kind of approach comes from. If I started with a, a function Let's say, uh, what do I want to use? Sure. And let's say that equals a constant, okay? There's a function that's that, and I'm going to say, oh yeah, well, and by the way, 
I want that to be, yes? Let's try to be a three. Let's try. Can you take the derivative of both sides of this? Yes. So what do you, what do you get? Well, C becomes zero and it comes up one. So it's sort of like the idea of a total differential. I don't know if you guys have done that before. No? Yes? No? Um, so if I do, so the derivative of this side obviously is zero. I like it. Now I take the derivative with respect to x, and what do you get? That's dx plus, now take the derivative with respect to y, what do you get? <laughs> dy. It's sort of like the, I, I can show you the official form, but I know a few of you guys have not done much with partials, but it's, it's the partial of f with respect to x, uh, got it. dx plus the partial of f with respect to y. Dy, got it. But you've done this before, like when you do u sub, u equals 4x, what's the derivative of the du equals 4dx, right? So now I do that piece dx and that piece dy. They both get a term because they're both in there. All right. So tell me this, who, who remembers this or who realizes this? Uh, if I start with f, and this is fx, right? And this is fy. That's another way to, dis, to do partials. The little subscripts mean the partial with respect to x, partial with respect to y. If I then get fxy and I get fyx, what's got to be true? They have to be equal to each other because it's very few functions that that wouldn't work for. There, it doesn't work for every function in the world, but you really have to work at it to make a function that it doesn't work for. Uh, this is called Clairaut's theorem. Ah, so the way to check to make sure, now here, I know, I know that this DE was developed from this function, right? I see it because we did it, but you're going to start here. So how do I know that this came from a function? Well, I check this piece, which is already X, so I do the partial of this with respect to Y. So in general, we call this form like this. So what I'm going to check is, what's the partial of M with respect to Y? Well, what is the partial of this respect to y? Careful, respect to y, 9x, 9x squared. Yeah. And what's the partial of this with respect to x? 9x, 9x squared. Which means the uh, f y x equals f x y. Which means they must have come from an f. There must have been an f that they came from. Now I know the way I've done this, I started with a frickin' F. So you're like, why are you checking, dude? Just look up here. <laughs> but if I'm given this, how do I even know to attempt what we would do here is, and it relies on the fact that it came from a single generating function. How do I know there is one? Well, if this piece truly is Fx, that means it better match up with this piece when I do their cross derivatives. It's good, they gotta match. That would mean that it came from a single F. All right, so how the shit, if I started here, that's the check, right? This is step one on this kind of exact DE is to check to make sure it's exact is this. This is the check. This part dy, partial y. This part partial x. If they're the same, they are. it is exact. I like it. And then what do I do if it actually comes out? How do I get this back? Well, this is where it becomes a little bit 180-ish in, in a sort of way. Let me see if I can throw this in here at the end. So the check. Yeah. So what was this? This has to be fx then, right? Yeah. Equals 9x squared y. So what is f then? I have to integrate this with respect to x. Mm -hmm. Now think about it. If I integrate it, now this is really kind of weird a little bit, but integrate with respect to x partially, that means that y is a constant. Mm -hmm. Which means instead of saying plus c, I say plus some function of y because that would be a constant. 
When you partially differentiate, you're treating the one variable as a constant. So when you integrate, you don't put plus c, you put plus function of that thing that's a constant. So what do you get when you just integrate this like normal? Of course you know it's going to be. But this would have been, integrate this, you get 3x cubed y, right? Mm -hmm. Plus some function of y. Now what is this? What is this? This is fy, right? Come on now. And this is f, isn't it? This is f. Yeah. How do I know that f exists? Because I did the check. I know it exists. So this is f, which is kind of silly. It's sort of like saying, how fast is John going? X miles an hour. You don't really know, but yes, we do. Mathematically, it's freaking x. So what f is this? I don't know what the shit this is. But I know what fy is supposed to be. So what's fy, knowing this is the form of the answer, what's fy? Well, it would be 3x cubed plus g prime of y. So what must g prime of y be? So I get, I look at, I could even, I could start with either one of these, but I could start with either one of these and I figure out the form of f. Stay with me now. This really isn't that hard, even if you've never seen it before. So I know f exists. So here's what f looks like. So that's as far as that gets me. Thank God I have more information. Fy is supposed to look like this. So let me figure out Fy right now. That's what Fy looks like from this. So what does g prime of y have to be? Negative freaking 1. And what's g of y then? This is with respect to y, of course. It's a function of y only. So when you integrate negative y, yeah. You know why? The answer to an exact differential will always be f equals zero, uh, not zero, f equals c, f equals a constant. So what is my f function? f function is going to be 3x cubed y minus y equals a constant, which of course is what we started with, of course. So we took it, we tore it apart in the differentials, and then we put it all back together. So I wanted to show you where it would come from, but you're going to start here, of course. You're going to check to make sure it's exact, and then you're going to start, I don't care which one of these, you just start with whatever, whichever one looks better. All right, stop it, Jeff. I normally start, to be honest, I normally start with the one that has more parts, because that makes this easy. Uh, if you do a few, you'll see what I mean. It doesn't truly matter, but... And the second part is solving. Yep. Checking to see if it's the right form, and then this is the process if it's in this form. I like it. Sorry that was so quick, but I want to at least throw the idea at you. We'll obviously use more of that idea next time. So, how did you get g of, oops, g of y equals negative y? No, uh, if g prime of y, and what's that prime have to mean? Because it's only a function of y. It must be in derivative with respect to y. Is negative 1, you integrate. Oh, okay. So that's negative y. Yeah. And the reason I don't worry about plus c is because the answer is going to be that equal to c. It's all going to get sucked into that c over there. Oh, yeah. So you can find the initial value. This can also then turn around and become an initial value following on a second step. Oh, yeah. Yeah, could. Yeah. I think it was class.